Hi, I'm Laura Simonoff, Dean of the Temple University College of Public Health, and joining me today are faculty experts Graciela Yashek, Sarah Bass, and Heather Murphy. Today, we're going to be discussing something that people are calling booster shots, which really are just third shots, um, third vaccine shots. They're nothing different from the other two that you might have gotten. And they've been approved in a somewhat limited way for Pfizer and um, probably for Moderna in the next while. And for J&J, &J, uh, the, um, I think the evidence is still um, perhaps not there. Um, so let's talk about what we mean by booster shots. Um, so Graciela, did you wanna define for everybody what everybody means by booster shots? Because I know people are a little confused. Yeah, so there is confusion about what is a booster shot and what's the difference with third shots. Because back in May, third shots were approved for immunocompromised patients. So what uh, research showed is that two shots for immunocompromised uh, people did not really uh, raise immunity in, in these people. So a third shot was approved and that was to be uh, delivered 28 days after people got their second shot. Booster shots are given when we have indications that our immunity is waning is going, you know, the antibodies in our bloodstream are starting to go down. And then we want to give that third shot uh, at least six, well, at least six months after the second shot to boost up our immunity. And so that, that's the difference between those two. Okay. Um, and, and it seems to have caused quite a, a bit of controversy. And um, so I'd like, maybe to, to review first um, what the CDC and the FDA have recommended. Um, I don't know, Heather, right, do you want to do that? Can, talk about, or, or, or Sarah? Um, I can probably that. give that overview. Okay. Um, I mean, I think, and that's part of the issue with that we've continued to have, you know, really over the whole COVID pandemic is just problems with messaging. So the, the FDA met approved boosters, but only for people who were 65 uh, and over, basically, and people who had uh, immune compromising uh, issues. CDC met last week and also expanded that to say that it should also be for frontline workers, although mm -hmm. they did not say what frontline workers really uh, were. So we're assuming that that meant healthcare workers, um, but for others, it could also include teachers or firemen or, you know, police officers. Um, and so, again, we have this kind of mixed message uh, between the two. And now I think states and cities like here in Philadelphia are trying to figure out what that means for, you know, how we're going to actually implement boosters uh, moving forward. I want to add a little bit to that. Uh, I think the part of the confusion also beyond the mixed messages is that the FDA came with some recommendations, then the CDC came up with some other recommendations, and then Rochelle Wal Wal um, Walensky. Walensky, thank you, I, I blanked out. Uh, she overrode what the CDC's committee said, and she said, now the boosters are going to be approved for 65, people 65 and over, and anybody 18 and over who is, um, who has an underlying condition, or people who are front workers. And I looked at the CDC website this morning, and in fact, they do say teachers are in fact included in that list. Mm -hmm. Uh, the frontline workers, such as health workers, transportation workers, people who work at long-term uh, care facilities and correctional uh, places. To name a few, I think there are a couple more, but I don't remember exactly what they are. So people are saying, well, what is it? We are told this and then we are told that. So I, you know, Sarah, you just put your finger <laughs> on the quid of the question. Mm -hmm. uh, problem, you know, what is going on? Yeah. And states are doing different things. I mean, um, I know my relatives who live in New York have already gotten their third shots. They, they mm. went to the pharmacy and 
they made an appointment and they got them. So it is has been very confusing. Um, but let's talk about whether we should be doing this. And again, there's been a lot of controversy about whether or not we should or should not be handing out um, third shots when so many people um, have not gotten even their first or second, including in this country, where although one might say that that's volitional, that people have chosen not to um, get vaccinated. And if you look in the state of Philadelphia, the state of Pennsylvania, actually I was about to call it the state of Philadelphia, but in many ways it is. Philadelphia right now looks quite different from most of the rest of the state. The Philadelphia metro region is actually the test positive rate this morning, it was 3.7%. That's great. Um, that's starting to approach where we were um, at the beginning of the summer before everything um, took off again. And, and that's because the city's been pretty aggressive of trying to get people vaccinated, both through programs to make it more accessible to people by mandates and also by reinstating an indoor mask mandate. But the rest of the state looks really different. Um, and we can do that actually state by state where certain parts of the state look like they're in pretty good shape and other parts, particularly rural areas are really, you know, in the throes of the worst part of the pandemic they probably have suffered from. Um, so anyway, uh, Heather, what, what do you think about this? So, you know, I know you're, you're in Canada right now and um, Canadians have initially had a lot of trouble obtaining vaccine, but now seem to to have obtained a supply vaccine. Um, what, what do you think about the United States moving in this direction? Well, I think Canada's not far behind actually in the boosters they're talking about. It's been recommended by our national, um, I guess, vaccine authority mm -hmm. that they're recommending boosters for immunocompromised and elderly populations. So similar to what's going on in the US. So I do think the boosters will happen here and it will be a piecemeal approach. Probably every province will have their own philosophy. I know Nova Scotia, the Minister of Health came out and said, absolutely no boosters for this province. We need to vaccinate the rest of the world first, um, whereas other um, provinces are lining up to get boosters, I think, for their vulnerable populations. So it seems to be divided in Canada. Um, personally, I like to think we do need to vaccinate the rest of the world before prioritizing boosters. Although I think boosters for vulnerable populations where the vaccine is waning make, makes sense. Like that, that makes sense. But there's also this public perception in all these rich countries, we're all go lining up for our third vaccines and a lot of the world is still hasn't been vaccinated. And half of my concern is that we're not gonna get out of this pandemic if we don't vaccinate the rest of the world because we're going to see more variants emerge probably. And hopefully not like the Delta, but their variants are emerging constantly. And if we just keep boostering all of us, we're going to, and we're just kind of chasing our tails a little bit. And so we do need to think of kind of this more global distribution. But I, I also recognize that stopping boosters in one country isn't going to necessarily vaccinate the rest of the world. Um, and that the conversation is more complicated than that, but kind of as a, someone in global public health, I have to advocate for those who don't have a vaccine yet and partners I've worked with in developing countries that still are not vaccinated and are waiting for their vaccines. Oh. Sarah, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, certainly from a public health perspective, I think we all agree that, you know, having the rest of the world um, vaccinated is an important thing. I think, you know, the, the reality of that uh, from an implementation perspective is is tough and we have to kind of think about what's happening in the US and you know how we can be protective of our public health as well um, and so you know the idea of saying well we shouldn't give boosters when we have the vaccine available but we are you know shipping billions of vaccine to other countries um, I don't know, it, it just seems like we would be shooting ourselves in the foot if we didn't try and make sure that we um, are as protected as we can be in the US. 
I know Graciela totally disagrees with you, Sarah. Uh, well, I was <laughs> talking about the fact, do we really need a booster? I mean, the science is very divided and most research or scientists will say, we don't have enough information for the boosters. At the same time, I recognize that, uh, you know, getting a third booster is an individual decision. It's a political decision. And um, some people who live at home with young children who cannot get the vaccine or immunocompromised people, they are worried and they want that booster. But we are basing all this on science that is still developing. Uh, we still don't know. We know we are basing this desire or this, um, this booster on information from some studies, such as a study that was conducted in Israel. Israel, they, were, uh, they uh, looked at 1.1 million people who got the Pfizer vaccine. And they noticed that people who were vaccinated at the very beginning of the pandemic in like January, March, uh, their, uh, the effective, effectiveness of the vaccine was lower and then that the circulating antibody in the blood was lower than those who were vaccinated later. But I have a problem with that because I feel like, well, at the beginning of the pandemic, it was frontline workers who got vaccinated and the elderly. And so they, they are particular frontline workers. They are in contact with people all the time. And then vaccines are not 100% and we have to understand that. So some people are, despite their vaccine, are going to get, uh, will get infected. Um, but then also the people, uh, at, you know, who got the vaccine, they felt like, oh, I'm okay, it's 95% effective, therefore I don't have to wear a mask, I can go to a restaurant, I can go, and they put themselves at higher risk. So my feeling is, well, let's take with the, this booster necessity with a grain of salt, because even though it, um, the study shows that there is waning immunity, we still have memory cells, and we know that uh, we still have intact memory cells, eight months after the first shot, and they can mount a, an immune response to, uh, to infection, and it pro still protects us, protect us against um, severe uh, infection and hospitalizations and death. Now, of course, when we say there are not enough antibodies circulating, that means that uh, there will be breakthrough uh, infections because our um, memory cells are a little bit slower than the antibodies to respond to, to that infection. And that's why we may get infected, but it will be very mild, a very mild infection. So I, again, I feel like, okay, I understand that we think that we need boosters, but we don't have enough information to uh, say with 100% certainty that this is really what we need because our immunity is not working anymore. And that, that's not the case. Our memory cells are still intact several months after the, uh, the right. shots. So Graciela, the thing is, is that nothing is 100. We know this in science. Nothing 100% right. certainty. I, I think we do know that older people's ability to mount an immune response is, is really very diminished. And in fact, um, older men, it's really much more than, than even older women. So from some of the studies that are out there, it, it to me, it makes sense at least that there are certain populations we'd probably want to do this with. I, I also don't agree that just because we haven't vaccinated the rest of the world, that it means Therefore, we should not be giving out third shots. And, and if somebody said, I'm going to wave a wand, and if all of you agree in the United States not to take a third shot, the rest of the world be vaccinated, I would be absolutely right there with you. But the fact is, is that the college runs a vaccination program, and every day now, we throw out tons of vaccines it's expired and we just have to throw it out. So wouldn't it be better to give those vaccines as third shots than just to put them in the trash? And, and, and I do think this country and Europe 
Uh, Australia, well, I don't know about Australia. They're not doing such a good job of vaccinating. Canada, we should redouble our efforts to make sure that vaccines go to where they need to go. They need to go to Africa, to Asia. Um, but I don't think that people not taking a third shot is really what's going to make that happen. If I did, I would totally agree with you, but it it, it won't. I mean, so I'm not but, sure. But, I'm, not, I'm not sure that for me, that argument doesn't hold water. I think it's a red herring, to be honest. No, and that to me, that argument is like comparing apples to oranges. I totally agree with you. We should not throw the shots away. I agree with Heather saying, you know, some populations, and you said it yourself, Laura, some populations have lower immunity, you know, compromise. They need that third shot, and then I'm totally for it. Uh, what, what I feel is like we should we should also concentrate on the fact that the structurally the world is uh, stacked up against poor countries and then that we have uh, all the systems pharmaceutical companies are negotiating with wealthy countries to buy these shots and we have in this country we have enough shots as you said we have like i think to vaccinate twice the amount of Americans who live in this country. So what I'm saying is that I think that we, we need to uh, increase the donations or countries, wealthy countries need to increase the donations. I think that uh, more funding should be given to COVAX and uh, Gavi, which are the uh, NGOs that deal with uh, vaccine and negotiating vaccines for the poor, the low income countries. I think we need to expand production. Uh, from the wealthy countries to the to Africa, for instance, transfer knowledge because it's a very complicated process to produce these vaccines. Uh, expand the um, the facilities in which these vaccines can be developed, and also I think that uh, we need to possibly waive intellectual um, intellectual property rights. Uh, pharmaceutical companies are against it because they are going to lose yeah. money. Uh, and, you know, that, that's, but the, uh, the government has the capacity or the power to waive those intellectual uh, property rights permanently or only temporarily. And I, I feel like, you know, I, I really resent the, you know, $2 trillion profits that pharmaceutical companies make. On the other hand, we need the pharmaceutical companies, we need their vaccines. And I think that they are justly saying, we need to have a very controlled process because if someone in, in, in uh, I don't know, in Malaysia is producing vaccine that is of lower quality and it kills people, it's their reputation on the line, it's the life of people on the line. And so I can understand both sides of the mm -hmm. argument, but I think we should, uh, put much more effort into helping developing nations. I, I agree with you. And um, I think all the editorials that I've read should stop hyper-focusing on third shots being given in the United States and talk about the very, very real issues that you just raised that are really preventing um, low-income countries from getting um, vaccinations. So, um, the last thing I thought we might just touch on is the J&J &J vaccine and Moderna. So I'm particularly J&J. &J. So there have been some studies, I don't know how definitive they are, um, that a shot two months later, second shot of J&J &J, um, makes that vaccine as effective as say incomparable to Moderna and Pfizer. Um, so what do you think about that? I know there's been a lot of people who received J and J and they're feeling kind of like they've been sort of left out, like, well, whatever, that's what you got and no problem for you. And meanwhile, we all know it's just not as effective, particularly with the Delta variant. So any thoughts about that? I guess that what I heard is that the Moderna and J&J &J vaccines 
are going to be the third, second or third shots are going to be approved by the FDA in the following, in the next weeks. But maybe, I'm pretty sure with Moderna. Heather? I considered mixing any doses for J and J. Like someone who had a J and J would then get a booster of, say, a Moderna or a Pfizer. No, like, they're I know doing in that. Canada, in, we mix does. Yeah, I know they're doing that in Europe. They're not doing that here mm. at all. It's not recommended. I mean, the interesting thing about that is J and J uh, was really marketed to be because it was one shot for people who either didn't like to get shots or, you know, were in life circumstances that getting them to come back for a second shot was more difficult. Now saying, oh, well, now you do need a second shot. I think we're going to have a hard time getting a lot of those folks uh, back in to get that second shot mm -hmm. if that does come to mm -hmm. fruition. Right. I guess the other thing for J and J was that it was easier to handle. It didn't need the, the sort yeah, of because you, you can store it in the refrigerator as against the uh, mm. Pfizer Moderna, which need to be refrigerated at like minus eighty degrees. Well, as it turns out, they they do need that kind of refrigeration, but they it turns out they're more stable once you take them out and just keep them in a cooler for a longer period of time, but that's something that we found out as, as the vaccine was, was used, but still J&J &J is definitely a more stable product and easier, easier to handle. I mean, in the end, in the US, we've given out so much less J&J &J yes. than the other two. I think the last time I looked on CDC website, it was only about 22 million doses over the whole country. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a much smaller piece of the, the vaccination pie <laughs> um, yeah. than the others. Definitely. So any last thoughts about boosters or things that you wanna impart to the audience about boosters? Well, I, I would say after speaking, you know, how we should vaccinate the rest of the world, and I totally agree with Heather on this issue. If Tempra offers a booster, I will definitely take it. <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, it's an individual decision. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, I will go for it. Yeah. Sarah? I would probably go for mm -hmm. it too. <laughs> You know, I, I guess we're on the front line, right? We're considered uh, front line as teachers. Yeah. I deal with 150 students every week. So, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, uh, I would have to wait and see. I would want to make sure my parents got it. That's for sure. I've got a 90 year old father and a mother with cancer. So I think booster shots for them would be would be good. So I do believe in immunocompromised people getting access. Yeah. All right. Well, um, and I would definitely take it too. Um, <laughs> we'll be back in two weeks. Um, please go to cph.temple.edu slash coronavirus, view other videos, find links to reliable sources of information, and uh, we'll see you in two weeks. Thanks.